Hey everybody, in this video we're going to talk about constant volume calorimetry. Constant volume calorimetry is a way by which chemists can measure the internal energy change or delta E for chemical reactions. So that subscript there, that RXN, is simply an abbreviation for the word reaction. So remember, the internal energy change is going to be the sum of two terms. It's going to be the heat that's transferred between a system and its surroundings, and it's also going to be the work that is done either on the system or on the surroundings by the system. So those are the two ways by which energy can flow between a system and its surroundings. And we've already talked about how to calculate both heat and work. Remember, if you wanted to calculate the heat absorbed or released by a system, it's simply going to be the product of the mass of the system, the specific heat capacity of the system, and then the change in temperature of that system. And then if we wanted to calculate work, it's simply going to be minus P delta V, where P is pressure, and delta V is the change in volume. So if we wanted to, we could calculate delta E by individually calculating the heat and the work and then adding those together, and that'll give us delta E. But look at all the information that we need in order to do that. We need the mass, we need the specific heat, we need the change in temperature, we need the pressure, we need the change in volume. That's a lot of stuff to measure just to get delta E. But constant volume calorimetry is a much easier method by which to, to measure delta E. And so that's what is normally used. So let me explain the theory behind constant volume calorimetry. So remember, delta E for any process or chemical reaction is gonna be Q plus W, heat plus work. By keeping the reaction in a constant volume environment, what you're doing is you're making the work term cancel out because think about it. If work is minus P delta V and there is no change in volume, that means your delta V is going to be zero, making P delta V zero, making work zero. So at constant volume, your work is going to be irrelevant. There is not going to be any work done between the system and its surroundings. So what you're doing is you're forcing all of that energy to flow between the system and its surroundings. You're forcing all of that energy to flow in the form of of heat. And so delta E for a chemical reaction at constant volume is just going to be the heat. It's going to be Q. And then the subscript V over there indicates that the reaction is taking place in a constant volume environment. So in order to have a reaction taking place at constant volume, what you need is a very rigid, tightly sealed container that will not expand or compress. And so what they use is this device here called a bomb calorimeter. So the actual container in which the sample to be reacted sits is called a bomb. So you have this bomb over here, and before you under before you run the chemical reaction, what you do is you flush that bomb out with pure oxygen gas, so you get rid of all the air and replace it with oxygen, and then you have a sample in there, and then the bomb is connected uh, by an ignition wire to a voltage source, okay? So you have this bomb full of oxygen with a sample inside, and as soon as that ignition wire fires up, in other words, as soon as you turn that voltage source on, the sample will ignite, it will burn completely and very quickly, and then that's usually going to release a lot of energy, causing the temperature to rise. And then you also have this water jacket, so you have this outer vessel that is filled with a, uh, with a measured known amount of water, and it's being stirred by a stirring mechanism over here that's usually connected to a motor, and then of course you have a thermometer to record the temperature change. So these are the components of a bomb calorimeter. And again, the whole point of this is to measure delta E, the internal energy change, for a chemical reaction. Now, in order to calculate the amount of heat that is absorbed by the calorimeter once you burn a sample, uh, you, you need to know both the temperature change and you also need to know the heat capacity of the calorimeter itself. You need to know how much heat that calorimeter can absorb uh, to undergo one degree of temperature change. And so we get this equation over here where we have the heat absorbed by the calorimeter is going to be the heat capacity of the calorimeter times the change in temperature. In order to determine the heat capacity of the calorimeter, usually what they'll do is they'll run a reaction that has a very well-known 
heat associated with it. They, they'll run a reaction that has a well-known delta E, and that will allow them, along with the temperature change, to determine the heat capacity of the calorimeter. And then, if you wanted to know the amount of heat released by the reaction, well, since this system is sealed, it's simply going to be the exact opposite of the heat that's absorbed by the calorimeter. So to get the heat of the chemical reaction, which also at constant volume is going to end up uh, being equivalent to delta E, it's simply going to be the heat absorbed by the calorimeter multiplied by minus one. So let's go ahead and do a problem where we use constant volume calorimetry. So this problem says that when 1.5 grams of benzoic acid, C7H6O2, is burned in a bomb calorimeter, the temperature rises from 23.50 degrees Celsius to 31.20 degrees Celsius. And we're asked to find delta E for this reaction in, kilo, in kilojoules per mole of benzoic acid. And it also says that the heat capacity of the calorimeter, which must have been determined from a different experiment, is 5.01 kilojoules per degree Celsius. So there's a lot of information in this problem, uh, but again, in order to determine the amount of heat absorbed by the calorimeter, it's going to be the product of the heat capacity of the calorimeter and the temperature change, delta T. So we're just going to multiply those two terms together. Again, the heat capacity of the calorimeter, that's 5.01 kilojoules per degree Celsius. The change in temperature is simply going to be the final temperature minus the initial temperature. So 31.20 minus 23.50 degrees Celsius those degrees Celsius units are going to cancel out and then upon evaluating this expression we're going to arrive at 38.6 kilojoules. So that is the amount of heat that the calorimeter absorbed. So the amount of heat released by the sample or by the chemical reaction is simply going to be the opposite of that. So in order to calculate delta E again at constant volume that's just going to be the heat that the reaction released and again that's going to be the negative of the heat that's absorbed by the calorimeter, which is simply going to be negative 38.6 kilojoules. But we're not quite finished, again, because the problem asks us to figure out delta E in kilojoules per mole of benzoic acid. So what we need to do is we need to take it a step further. We need to take that negative 38.6 kilojoules and we need to divide it by the amount of benzoic acid in moles. So again, to get it in kilojoules per mole, to get delta E, we're going to take that negative 38.6 kilojoules and we're going to divide it by the amount of benzoic acid in moles, which is not given, but we can figure it out easily because they do give us the mass of benzoic acid, 1.5 grams of it. And then we can use the molar mass of benzoic acid, which is from the periodic table, 122.12 grams of benzoic acid per mole of benzoic acid. Uh, notice that the grams go on the bottom, the moles go on top, such that the grams are going to cancel, and then we're going to be left with a unit of kilojoules per mole once we evaluate this entire expression. And the number I got turns out to be minus 3.1 times 10 to the 3 kilojoules per mole. So for every mole of benzoic acid that undergoes this combustion in that bomb calorimeter, that's going to release over 3,000 kilojoules. So that's a lot of energy. So it's a lot of energy just sort of packed into that system, just ready to burst out. And all you need is just that one spark of ignition, assuming that you have more than enough oxygen to go around. Okay, so I hope this video helped you out a little bit. And that's it. So have a good one.